now. The first uh, artist I'm going to bring up is Bates, a self-made St. Louis rap artist, writer, director, producer of her own music videos and albums. The founder, also a producer and driving force behind FemFest, an annual festival that's held every February featuring over 50 female bands of all genres on two stages. Uh, from 2015 to 2019, she was awarded the best female hip hop artist, best video, best album, and became the first woman to be awarded the Artist of the Year in the St. Louis Underground Music Awards. Uh, for uh, 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 for her albums, Colored Folk, Strange Woman, and her most recent, One God. They've all been groundbreaking and provocative with great local and regional exception. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, Bates. <laughs> No stranger to the uh, Jazz St. Louis stage, six-time Grammy Award-winning uh, composer, trumpeter, and music educator Terrence Blanchard started his career in 1980 as a member of the Lionel Hampton Orchestra. He has been one of Art Blakey's Jazz Messengers, which is a really big deal in the jazz world. In case you didn't know, he's composed more than 40 film scores and performed on more than 50. He's received his first nomination for the Academy Award. Uh, for best original score, despite his uh, film *Black Klansman*, you heard about his work uh, with uh, with opera theater. So please welcome to the stage, my man, Terrence Blanchard. <laughs> And Joanna Mendoza regularly records, performs, and teaches in and outside the United States as a violist of the Ariana String Quartet and professor of viola at the University of Missouri St. Louis. She has received critical acclaim for both live performances and commercial recordings, including Ariana's most recent recording of the complete Beethoven cycle, which you should check out. Uh, she is a founder of Ariana Arts Incorporated, a nonprofit organization that engages and enriches the community in world class music. They host the Ariana Chamber Music Festival, an international summer music festival in St. Louis that brings together a cross section of aspiring musicians from St. Louis, the U.S., and South America for a cultural and musical exchange. Joanna's most recent collaboration is with Washington University sculptor Lindsay Stover, where they will create electronic soundscapes on the electric viola. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Joanna Mendoza. So we were sitting backstage just talking a little bit about, uh, about things, and I was mentioning the fact that uh, along with uh, celebrating 20 years here at um, at Jazz St. Louis, uh, also celebrating 30 years in the music industry uh, uh, because I, I started working with orchestras. And back when I started, 30 years ago, uh, <laughs> one of the big things that everybody was talking about was uh, how do we get more inclusion and diversity? Actually, they didn't even use the word uh, inclusion. They just talked about how do we get more diversity uh, in our audiences. And uh, it seems that uh, that's something that they're still talking about today. So uh, you all each perform in different music genres. Uh, can you talk about the, uh, the cultural, ethnic, and gender makeup of your respective fields? And uh, what's changed since you've begun? Or what changes are still needed? <laughs> I mean, I think all y'all know that hip hop is predominantly black. Golly, but um, but yeah, so it's predominantly black. We had some uh, white artists coming in. Uh, questions of appropriation have been coming up recently because uh, we have more white artists coming in, um, and all the things that go with that. So. Um, and uh, since hip hop also represents R and B too, uh, I don't know. If it's kind of like hip hop and R and B. It's like one clump, and of course that's also predominantly black. So, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, we see a lot of uh, change as far as like hip hop and R and B goes. Uh, as far as diversity, more recently, um, yeah, it's something to think about. Mm -hmm. I, 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 you know, I think the thing that I would say is that you know, especially in the opera world. Um, Man, it's about stories not about really. 
is what it's about, you know. And I've learned that with the success of Champion. Um, it's been interesting seeing Champion go from uh, <coughs> city to city. It's, it's about to have its sixth production in Detroit. And we're really good. Thank you. Uh, and it's an amazing ride for me because, man, I was just happy when it was here in St. Louis. <laughs> um, but the thing that's been interesting about wherever it goes, uh, I think the the the, uh, the the reviewer in D.C. said it best. He said, I've been covering opera for 30 years. And he said, this is the most diverse audience I've ever seen at an opera production. Um, when I went to New Orleans, um, a guy came up to me after one of the shows and he said, if this is opera, I'll come. And I think that that is the thing that we have to constantly keep in the forefront of our minds, especially when it comes to orchestral and operatic music. You know, it's really about having these stories that are relevant to people's lives, you know. I love La Boheme, you know, because I'm a musician. I understand the significance of it as an opera. I understand the importance of it as an opera. But to the lay person, they may not relate to that story, you know. Um, so when you t start talking about doing an opera about Emil Griffith, you know, and then doing an opera about Charles Blow. You know, people can look at those stories and see themselves in, that story, in those stories. And I think that goes a long way to also attracting young people to be a part of the process. Because if they see themselves in the work, then it inspires them to be a part of it. You know, years ago when I was a kid, um, they had a program where they would bus us to go see the symphony play in New Orleans. And I remember when I went, there was one guy that was African American in the orchestra. He played flute. Um, and years later, I come back to New Orleans, uh, and I was scoring a film in New Orleans, and I got a chance to to hire him. You know, just as my little way of saying thank you to him, right? Well, when I hired him and he came to the session, I told him the story. I said, man, I, I remember when I was a kid, I saw you uh, playing with the orchestra. And he told me, he said, you're the reason why I stayed as long as I did. And that meant a lot to me because that is, the, I am the manifestation of his efforts. And, you know, we need to continue that cycle and broaden it. So it's not about having one guy in the orchestra. It's about having women of all backgrounds. It's about having people from all different backgrounds being part of it. And about the orchestras and the opera companies creating works that mean something to these folks, you know, and we can't live in a bubble. It has to constantly move forward and be progressive. Yeah, I, I totally agree, and um, having the breadth of different kinds of music and composers represented on, on the stage, um, on the classical music stage, is, is so is so important and one thing you know one thing I ask my students is say they're working on I mean we work on classical repertoire I say what do you have in common with or, or with Mozart or with Beethoven and they sit there <laughs> I said well you have a sense of humor you cry you're overjoyed you're struggling with something, you know, there are these, and that's ultimately what music, all music, I don't care what the genre is, about emotion and about self-expression and about the human condition. And I think that that's the task of classical music is to, um, to give permission to experience that regardless of the genre. And, um, in the classical music world, um, I mean, I, I, I've seen with, I, I think mm -hmm. one of the ways to get diversity in the audience is to get diversity in on the stage. And, um, and orchestras began doing that, at least in the United States, um, when they had uh, auditions behind a screen. And to their credit, I have to say, um, St. Louis has one of the most diverse orchestras in the United States. And um, I believe that St. Louis has one of the most diverse musical, and, cl and as even in classical music, 
in the United States. And I think that a lot of that actually has to do with um, the recent change in the, in the um, musical field, which is going away from traditional jobs. And, um, you know, orchestras are expensive. And um, smaller, uh, uh, St. Louis is actually laden with small groups, small ensembles. And they're led with women. They're led with people of all colors. And, um, and it's really exciting. It's, it, um, so I think that's, uh, um, that's an important thing. And, and one thing I want to add about um, the, the, even in chamber music, um, the new uh, cellist of the Juilliard String Quartet is an African-American woman. So it's, it's not, it still has a way to go. Um, but but it, it, there has been a change, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, we talked a lot uh, about the classical field. I think that, uh, you know, and, uh, what needs to change. The music, I mean, people tend to, as we've talked a little bit, they, uh, they talk, they, they, they gravitate towards music that reflects their own culture. But ultimately, art is about communicating, to, about creating something that goes beyond one's own culture, I think, and communicates broadly. So, I mean, within jazz, within rap, and you mentioned that, that there are some, there is some mix, but is there, is it, are there, are there as many barriers as there would seem to be? Um, it, as far as, it, it all depends on what demographic you're coming from. It's great for black men. Um, so there are lots of barriers in hip hop. I'm not gonna read it front like it's not. You know, this is, for it to be the, the voice of the powerless and the lowly, you know, it's still, one of the places where you were most, uh, most degraded, the most, uh, it's, it's really tough to keep your head up in hip hop as a woman, as a gay male, um, without the, the big grandiose, if you, if you have a message, I don't know, I mean, it's a couple of things I can talk about that lead to that, you know, it's, a, it's reasons for the message being like clouded out that, that, and all the different things that, that actually represent the people who represent hip hop. Hip hop is a culture, it's not just a music genre, it's a culture. So when we talk about music as a culture, um, and you say how do we get these different cultures of people to get into classical music, you're talking about getting a culture of people who are hip hop culture to go into classical music. Mm -hmm. So really, it's really meshing the cultures, you know, it's some sort of like biracial mix with these two types of things, you know what I'm saying? Because in order for you to be able to pull that off, you have to tap into what's what hip hop culture has to offer as well. Other than that, you're gonna have a tough time recruiting people, making people turn their heads and pay more attention to classical music. Um, I was just telling Joanne in the back, um, what I experienced in high school though, um, was that we had, uh, all through high school, all through college, we sang classical music. We sang, we, we might have a little little bit of eth ethnic music where we, we might travel to Africa, we might go to Argentina, we might go to Germany, you know, but it's all a classical, it's all class and train operatic music. Mm -hmm. And for us to not have, to see these faces was kind of puzzling to me when we all talking in the background, like, well, why is that? And the only thing I could come up with was like, look, I was one of those kids who were classically trained to do these things. And then when I got out of high school, nobody from Opera House, nobody from any of these places came and said, came to these concerts we were doing, came to the adjudications where we got all those ones at, and said, hey, young girl, you can do this. So it came to any of my counterparts and said, hey, why don't you come and try it out with us? Mm -hmm. So sometimes it takes for the elders to reach out to the youth mm -hmm. in order to keep it young, keep it funky, you know, keep it funky, but also, you know, be able to reach out to them on, and meet them on the level where they're at. Sometimes it just takes for you to grab them by the hand mm -hmm. and give them the stage. Her main question was like, well, do you think that they even care about that type of thing? You know, you think that's kind of cool enough for them? I'm like, you'll be surprised how many kids are, we want to sing. Kids want to be on the stage. That was like a lot of kids' freedom. And like I said, it's hip hop culture that they attach themselves most to. And that's your freedom. Music is where you set yourself free. The art, the dance, the DJing, that's where you set yourself free at. Yeah. You know? So people want to attach to, if they, those kids attach to that, then that's how you can attach to them. And that's where you can meet them at. Yeah. I think that's so important because the, you know, we talk a lot about the classical music being sort of the pinnacle, right? But there's excellence in all genres. And I think the thing about art is what's really going to define what's great is going to be the test of time. 
and things like rap and jazz, and they they only have a finite amount of time. They just only when UB Blake died, the, the entire history of jazz could be contained in one lifetime. So you know, years from now, you already see the rep, the reverence that 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 artists that. that Audiences have for people like Miles Davis and Duke Ellington right. now. So is that going? So how does um, <clears throat> how does that paradigm of sort of the the classical music the only classical music can elevate? How does that how does that uh, affect or how does that impede uh, the progress? Well, see, the way I was raised, we didn't think that. We didn't think classical was the pinnacle. Mm -hmm. We thought classical was just an alternative. We, we, we were taught that jazz is a natural extinction of an art form, that both of these art forms were created and the, they were reflections of the communities from which they were created. You know what I mean? And I remember when I was playing with our breaking man, some guy wanted to say, well, jazz is African. And he was sitting down saying, he said, because if, it was, if that was the case, they'd be swinging in Africa. And then uh, jazz is an American art form. It has combined European essence, uh, uh, African Caribbean uh, influences brought all of those things together. And I think when we start saying that classical music is the pinnacle, my composition teacher who studied in Vienna, he always challenged me. He said, well, what is classical music? What is it? Why is the word classical being used to describe a European art form? when jazz is just as classical as anything else. Right. So, you know, we, 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 I think that's where we have to start. We have to start at breaking things down and, and start looking at the differences and celebrating the differences and looking at what everything has brought to the table, you know? Uh, and when we do that, then we can deal with these stigmas, you know? It's one of the things that I love about Apathy of St. Louis. You know, when I first, started working with him, Stephen Lord told me, he said, listen man, I don't feel like we can find what American opera is. And he said, I think American opera should have some form of what the jazz culture is because that's American. It's an American art form. So we gotta start by readjusting our thinking about all of these things, you know, because we have to look at them as, as, as being a reflection. Because I find it very interesting anyway, when you look at it, when you look at Stravinsky, I was, I've been talking about this for the last couple of days since I've been here. When you look at a lot of these great composers, they took folklore anyway and, and expanded on folklore. That's really what they did. So they were in the communities and looking at what was happening in the communities and taking that germ and, and you, well, I'm taking that, that influence and using it as a seed to blow things up into something else. Well, that's what you know we've been trying to do as composers. That's what I've been trying to do as a composer. So I'm not looking at these elements, you know, I, I was talking today to some of the, the donors and some of the, the, the docents, you know, at Opera Theater St. Louis, and one of the things that I've been realizing since I've been writing opera is that I'm not thinking about writing jazz. I'm not thinking about writing classical music. I'm thinking about telling a story. Mm -hmm. And if, it, if, if there's a moment in time where, the, where there needs to be what we call traditional swing, I'm going to use it. If it's not, I'm not going to use it. I'm going to use something else. So I'm trying to bring all of these things together, you know what I mean? in a way that Dizzy did to create what we call Latin jazz. You know, we always have to have these terms to kind of bottle things up. And I get tired of the terms because the terms kind of kind of put us in a it's in a quandary where we something new comes along, we don't know where to fit it. So if we don't know where to fit it, it doesn't matter. It does it's not worth anything. And that has to stop. We have to look at things for what they bring to the table. I've been teaching for for, for 30 years, man. And I run into some kids that you cannot define. You can't define what they are or what they do. And, and it was interesting, because when I started teaching them, when I was at the Monk Institute, I used to get flack for not making these guys learn how to play Sweet George Brown. <laughs> and that, and, and it, was, it was frustrating to me, because I was sitting there saying, OK, I think they should know what Sweet George Brown is. But this guy is bringing something else to the table. Why don't we experiment and try to see how we can build that up? Because he's gonna bring something that I'm not thinking about and that you're not thinking about, right? So it doesn't have to, we, these requirements, I think are the things that kind of put us in these boxes. Mark O'Connor did something I thought was really amazing because he started talking about how young kids, when they get into music, we start learning, 
European folklore. Those little songs that you learn when you're a little kid, when you start to play on the piano. Well, he, he wanted to turn that around. He came up with a whole curriculum that's based on American folklore for these young kids to learn how to play their instrument from an early age. And I think, I thought it was brilliant. You know, because to me, that's saying, okay, you're turning the whole paradigm around about what classical music is supposed to be. So if this little folk tune from, from Alabama or from Louisiana or from wherever is the focal point that's going to get this kid into playing music, what do you call it then? I think it's interesting that, you know, it's kind of a, I don't know if it's a human thing or a American thing or what, to really look for a hierarchy. Like this idea that something's got to be better than another thing, which is just absolutely, you know, it's the wrong question, you know. And um, and the other thing is that classical music, jazz, hip hop, these are broad. They're, I mean, the I gave this class on extended techniques in classical music. This is using an instrument in a completely different way than, you know, using the bow and, you know, just what we think of as playing. And I, as I was doing more and more research for this, I realized that they were using extended techniques as early as, you know, mm -hmm. 17, 1600s, you know. So um, their composers were always looking for different sounds and creating an amalgam of different sounds and, and styles and not not just have it not just um, you know one way or following rules that's not you know so um, knowing that there you know each one of these genres is so vast that there will be something that probably everybody can resonate with on, in some way you know, that it's not just like, we can't just say classical music sounds like this. You have no idea what that sounds like. It's a, yeah. So, and I mean, I think that everything you're saying is absolutely 100% spot on. But are we, you know, having said that, are we really satisfied? Are we satisfied with the audiences that we have for our different genres? I, listen, I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, well, well, the thing, well, the thing is, is that you know, with the, with the, I, I'll just use Champion as an example. You can't be lazy when it comes to. We were talking about this back then. You can't be lazy when it comes to marketing. That's probably one of the biggest problems that we're, we're not talking about. A lot of this happens because people want to take the easy route in marketing pro, uh, projects, mm -hmm. right? So when it came time to do Champion, man, you know, Albert Theater St. Louis had me here all the time. I was going into the schools, I've been to churches, I know more about St. Louis than I ever know. <laughs> <laughs> I think like, you know, your wife Robin is going on Zillow. Man, she was on Zillow looking at property. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, but, 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 the thing, but the thing about it is, is that in going into these different communities, man, going to these, these places and talking to people, they started talking about the opera. And they started to show up. It goes back to the thing of relevancy we were talking about earlier, you know? But you have to figure out a way, if you have a unique product, figure out how to market it. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I get so sick and tired of it, especially in the film industry. I was telling you guys about when, we, when I, I worked on a film called Talk To Me with Don Cheatham. And I was at the premiere, man, some of the executives didn't even realize I was standing there. They said, we don't know how to market this movie. And I went, you gotta be kidding me. A movie with all of those songs in it and you don't know how to market this movie? That's because it doesn't fit into your idea of what these movies should be. Mm -hmm. But I have a whole family, a group of friends and, and, and extended family who would love to go to this movie if they knew it existed. That's, it's just that simple. So I think the, the, that question has to deal with who are the marketers? How diverse are those guys? You know, do they have women? Do they have people from all different backgrounds? Do they have people of all different sexual orientations on the marketing teams to sit down and say, hey, I got an idea, you know? Yeah. And listen to it, because I think that some of these commercials, man, when I'm watching, man, it's hard for me to watch sports. <laughs> it is, because I get tired of the drunk dudes who's selling beer, 
it's the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over again. And my thing is, it's like, we are evolving as a people. We are evolving as a human race. And we, we, we have to be brave enough to go out and say, okay, let's go after these people. Let's go after these kids. Because you know what's going to happen? Man, they're going to lose them. They're going to lose them. Because now, these kids can find what they want. It's, not, it's different now. When I was coming along, they had three channels. You know what I mean? And they could, they could, they could just literally shove something down your throat and it would become popular. Right? It's not like that now. Well, yeah, I mean, the, the fact that we don't have three channels, we have like three gazillion channels. No, and we have not television, but Netflix and everything else. We don't have that, that common, common um, kind of experience that we all share. I mean, back when I was growing up, if there was a, something in the news, Everybody knew about it. Whereas now you can miss stuff. If you're not if you're not connected, you'll miss things. Everybody knew about the if latest. You're not 45, you're not right. <laughs> <laughs> or you know, just the most recent um, you know, whatever episode of such and such show, if you everybody saw it, you know, twenty years ago, but now we're third, forty. Um, but now you can miss so many things. Like I mean, we don't share that common. You know, I'm, 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 I'm gonna tell you this. You know, and I keep and I, I don't want to. I'm not doing this because I'm in St. Louis. Really, I'm not. I'm doing this because I really love those folks at Opportunity St. Louis and everything that they do. Because when Champion went to another city, I'm not gonna tell you what city. And went to another city. The director of the opera company said, "Where are your famous friends? They should buy tickets." Oh. And, and when that was sent to me, I said, wow, first of all, I don't have 3,000 famous friends <laughs> to fill this theater. That's number one. And shouldn't you do your job to market this market? And that's what I'm talking about. It's like not being lazy. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I know I'm talking about this a lot because I'm, I've, I've gotten it throughout every aspect of my career. When I started making films, I would play clubs. And the clubs wouldn't bring me unless I had a film that was released. Mm -hmm. Because they wanted to piggyback off of the, the, the uh, promotion for the film and not do anything for the club. And I'm sitting there saying to myself, wow, you should want to pr promote your product as, a, as, a, as an entity that, whether it's me or anybody else, you put quality entertainment on the stage. Mm -hmm. That should be your thing. When we get to the point, man, where we can hold those guys' feet to the fire and make decisions about that without buying, because that's where it all stems from. It all stems from what we purchase, you know, and 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 how we purchase things, you know. It's it's one, of, and you guys know this. It's one of the biggest indicators in the film. First two weeks is the most important thing whenever a film is released, because however the film sells that's determining what the marketing for the film is going to be for the rest of this direction, which is kind of ludicrous to me. Because to me, if you feel like you have a good product and you have confidence in it, go ahead and put it out there and say, hey, man, this is a great thing. And it may be different. And the thing that always kills me about that, the guys who are brave enough to do that, they change the industry. You know what I mean? The guys who are brave enough to do Shawshank Redemption, I've always said, how do you pitch that movie? Right? But then next thing you know, everybody wants to show Shane Redemption. How many dinosaur movies we got after? <laughs> right? You know what I mean? But somebody had to be brave enough to do the first one. It's the same thing with the baseball movies, yeah. Feel the Dreams, when that came out. So I, it's frustrating me because I'm sitting there saying there's countless examples of people who have creative minds and who are brave, who are constantly doing things that change the paradigm, right? But then we run across the people who are not brave enough. And they just want to sit down and say, okay, well, no, this doesn't fit into our formula, mm -hmm. right? So then the project suffers. There, have, there, there have been a number of projects that I worked on that are great projects, you know, that nobody knows about. Mm -hmm. And it's a frustrating thing as an artist because they are not expecting that from you when you're working on it. When you're working on it, you get, you catch hell. Mm -hmm. They want everything done the correct way. And then you put together a beautiful thing that's powerful and makes a statement, but they don't get it or understand it, the next thing you know, it's just gonna sit on the shelf. Mm -hmm. 
And it's a frustrating, it's, it's, it's very frustrating, man. And, and the, the part about it that I keep saying that's so frustrating is that I've been here and seen it work differently. It's not rocket science. It's not. It's just effort. And intentionality. Exactly. You know, exactly. Absolutely. I mean, that's, I think, one of the most important things is that it's not about, it's it's not just putting an ad in the paper. No. It was engagement of, you know, of the audience that you want to. So you go and you, you tell them, you talk, you, you engage them in the conversation. And, 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 and not only that, man, it's a give and take. Mm -hmm. When I was here working with these kids, it's a beautiful thing to sit down in a room and work with these kids and helping them have an experience learning something. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, they're saying, well, that, yeah, that guy that wrote the opera, he came to my school today. Right. That goes a long way, man, because it's, the, the, the kids are walking away with something that they can use in their life. Mm -hmm. it's not, I'm just not trying to go out there and sell tickets. Right. You know, it's, a, it's, it's about creating a community, mm -hmm. you know, and it, and it works. That's the that's a, that's a thing, you know. I, I'm telling you, people are going to hate St. Louis because I talk about it all the time. <laughs> that, that I talk about it all the time. Even in New Orleans, when we brought the opera to New Orleans, it's my hometown, and we were fighting with them to about, about how to market the opera. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And we and here's the wild part of Some of y'all know my wife, she, she knows she doesn't really take any crap. So uh, <laughs> she made these people do certain things, and people showed up. Showed up, people had never been to the opera, showed up. They were worried about ticket sales. And all of a sudden, the opening night, the, the theater's filled with people. It's not, it's not rocket science. It's about being courageous, just as courageous as these artists are who are trying to do things and express themselves and just be themselves. The markets have to, be, have to do the same thing. Now, uh, one thing, uh, it, it, speaking about intentionality, we, they intentionally uh, gave you an opportunity to present some of the music from the opera today. Yeah, let's do so, uh, so I want you, would you mind, uh, would you mind setting it up? Uh, we got to, uh, I think, uh, don't be in such a rush. Yeah, um, I gotta calm down now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, you know, there's specific faces that come in mind while I'm talking to you. I, I wish they were in the room right now, you know what I mean? And if we got a videotape of this, please give it to me, because I'm gonna send it to them. Uh, if you want, I could just sit here and be your angry translator. <laughs> 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 generous person with this story that's a very painful one you know to go through sexual abuse from a family member you know is something that a lot of people are suffering with in silence you know they're dealing with the shame of it you know the pain of it and this guy decided to write a memoir about it and open up about it and just be very very courageous and sharing his story so um, he grew up in Gibson, Louisiana, and uh, he was an awkward kid. He didn't necessarily fit in. He was the youngest of five boys, and he was always trying to find his way. He's always wanted to do other things. So the, the piece that you're going to hear is his mom uh, talking to him, telling him, don't be in such a rush to grow. You know, basically, and, and the, thing that, the, the thing that moves me about the piece is that while she's talking to him, you're hearing her pain. You're hearing how she probably was the same way as him growing up, but she would probably never tell him that. But in the midst of this, she's talking about someday I'm going to go to school and I'm going to be something and make something of myself. And uh, it's a very powerful thing. And when you hear this woman's voice, oh my God, she is uh, amazing. Come on up. This is Karen Slack.
the problem is that the men are only allowing these things in, and that's who's the gatekeepers. So we're not getting to see uh, female lyricists. Lyr Rhapsody, she's a female rapper from New York. She's been up nominated for multiple Grammys. As far as her uh, music, it's not really my, my particular thing because I'm not that big of a hip, New York hip hop fan. But uh, I will say that as far as how it was written, as far as the composition, as far as the thought put into her project, it's no reason why she should have lost that particular category uh, in, in the multiple music awards she's been nominated in. Yes. But a, a lot of that is because we don't have enough representation. I saw recently, in the last couple of years, Young and May popped out. Young and May is a black lesbian, uh, well, I think she's kind of Latino, black lesbian woman um, from New York as well. And she, she made a track that came out, but it was also repeating the same misogynistic things that male artists say on a regular basis about women. So it still was the same ideology that you would get from the male artists repeated through the mouth of a woman to other women. So it, well, it was us used, that we're kind of being used as a weapon against ourselves constantly. Mm -hmm. And so the reason why I create things like Film Fest is to be able to be able to sit there and it, it's a joy to me to be able to go and grab all these different women, go to their concerts, go check out their material. You know, the thing is, is that if we don't get other people to go do it. So it's kind of hard to get Men will come to the concert because it's women there, you know? <laughs> but the stigma around women in hip hop is crazy. It's like the things that they get, the, 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 the pushback they get when they're trying to break into the industry. When you only have two women that are on mainstream hip hop right now, that should really tell you something. It's two, and I could pull 50 something out in St. Louis by itself. So that should tell you how hard it is for us to get there. Uh, one of the main things that really concern me is not how we're represented, how our voices are being heard, the and the misogyny that we have to go through just to get on. So we're having, like Rick Ross said a couple of years ago, well, I was a big fan of Maybach music, because I like Wale, I like Meek Mill, you know? And I, I felt like that was a good fit for me, you know, considering I could come just as street as them, just as real as them, I can write, my pen game is just as good as theirs. And, but he came in and he said that Basically, in so many words, he wasn't signing any woman that wasn't having sex with him. And and he wasn't trying to sign women. No, what he said was he wasn't trying to sign women because he was afraid that he'd be trying to have sex with them. So you mean to tell me that your sexual desire, you can know, have almost every woman you want, man, but your sexual desire makes you want, it's so strong to the point where you have to blackball women entirely from your whole entire record label, your power source, your gate that you can actually pave a way for other women to get on. You know, another issue is that we constantly have to deal with being the feature writer. Or men not thinking that we are able to uh, write for ourselves or express ourselves. Or and a lot of another thing is just not being relatable. Um, one thing I learned as an artist, why when you hear bass, you don't know what to expect, is because I have to change my name in order for men to recognize me mm. on the stage. I would constantly get the horrible slides on the stage. They'll mm. call, they'll call up the lineup for the night, and they'll put me where they know nobody is there. Mm. You know, I've been in some horrible situations is that from, from that early on in my career, so I was just like, look, how about I just drop the normal Bates entirely and just say Bates? Wow. You know, and it, then I started getting more bookings because people didn't know. And then they hear my voice, they hear my music, and they'll go, whoa, who is that? And then, and then I pop up, and they're like, no, we're looking for Bates. And I'm like, hey, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's, been, it's been quite a trial as a woman in hip hop, and it's even worse for women who dress like women quote unquote, you know, uh, in hip hop because they have to go through people not taking them serious out the gate. They'll get, they'll link with these guys, sometimes even women, um, they'll link with these, these people and they'll say, okay, well we're gonna help you record your music and whoop de whoop whoop. Uh, same thing R. Kelly going through right now. He say, hey little young girl, come here, <laughs> help you record your music and then the next thing you know, they're actually using you as a sex object and they're, in order for you to get your music through, you have to continuously have these sexual favors and then before you know it, you become irrelevant to the entire, to the entire subject. So hip hop and hip hop, R&B, those two genres for sure. And I've also heard it from a lot of pop artists, country artists. You know, it's different for me to hear it in classical music because it's not so much man, one man engagement that, that controls your whole entire fate, you know. So it, it's very interesting across the board how misogyny plays a part and how little opportunities we have. In the classical music world, I mean, I'm very aware of the fact that I'm, I'm 
a lot of women went through this for me to have the, this opportunity that I've had, the opportunities that I've had. I mean, you're describing something for writers of the 16th, 17th century, female uh, writers of books, of music. You're, that's what you're describing. It's changing your name so that you know you're not recognized as a woman. I mean, that's amazing that you have to do that, or that you do that now, right? right. And um, so I'm, I'm. It's it's slightly different. However, I will say that um, you know I know that um, in leadership positions, for instance, like conductors, they're largely men, largely underrepresented by women, and. Um, Composers. I mean, the while there there are tons of female classical composers, and, and um, the Philadelphia Orchestra, for instance, is having an entire season next season dedicated to female composers. Why do we have? And that's wonderful. But why do we have to make that distinction, too? You know, I mean, I'm glad that we are, and and they have to be um, celebrated. But at the same time. As long as that um, qualitative distinction is being made, it means that it's not an equal playing field. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have to really piggyback on that because I went when I first s stepped out. This I didn't know it was going to be as, as tough as it is, you know. And to have to make that distinction was a big thing when it came to me winning the Song Festival Awards. So at that point, when I won the first one in 2015, it was Best Female Hip Hop Artist, and but we were having this thing, the way it was like a spark. Somebody wrote an article in the Riverfront Times and it had the top 10 uh, artists at the time. And uh, no women were mentioned. There were so many women that were doing things in the city. So a bunch of the women, I, we just started having a conversation about it, which made me start to say, okay, well, we need to, to form something, which is really how I came about with Fan Fest and stuff like that. That little seed that got planted, that little yeah, I got me messed up. Maybe we create like fan fest, you know, something huge. So, um, but that that segue into me saying, okay, next time I'm going to the hip hop awards, I'm going for artist of the year. Mm -hmm. I would be the first. I, I was really only just trying to get nominated. Mm -hmm. So I went and did my research. I said, what do I need to do to be artist of the year in this? You know, because I would be the first one to do it, and we need to break open the door for somebody needs to do it. Uh, come to find out it had never been a history, it had never been a woman that, that won that category, never had been nominated for that category. Not only that, no woman had ever been nominated for top, for video, uh, best album, or any of those things. So that year I ended up taking home all of those. So I try to every day you have to spark that fierceness in women. You have to get them to get to realize that's their importance. Like, and that's really important that we see it as women that we are the change and without us this really is no movement at all. You know, this is a boring genre. I've been talking crazy about us all the time. If you didn't have a woman to, to, to misogynize, what would you be talking about? So, <laughs> so, so yeah, those particular ways, opening doors, why does it always happen? We still make it first. Look at that. <laughs> way to do it because you know um, we've been talking about that women in opera you know um, and one of the things that Karen talked about backstage is female leads you know it's something that needs to be talked about um, and needs to be dealt with so uh, what's the next thing we're going to say uh, leave it in the road wow that's kind of appropriate <laughs> for, uh, <laughs> for what we're talking about because it kind of piggybacks on what she was talking about. 
you know, this, this thing is about, you, you're going to go through some trials and tribulations in your life, you know, and that's what Charles's mom is trying to tell him, but you got to leave it in the road. You got to leave it behind and move forward. You can't become consumed by it, you know, and uh, that's what he did. And look at what we have. I, I, I was talking about this earlier. Look at what we have in a brilliant writer, a brilliant mind who has been able to tackle some of the issues of our country right now, you know, and if we wouldn't have had his mom, we wouldn't have had him. You know, so uh, this is a powerful one for me too. So we're gonna bring Bob and Peter back to the stage, right? Yeah, I didn't do that the last time. I was rushing up here trying to do the steps. So I'm gonna talk to you, yeah. Right? I'm gonna talk a little bit just so they can get set. And then uh, this has been a, an amazing experience. Uh, uh, writing opera uh, for me because uh, I get a chance to tell stories my way. You know, working in film, I'm always reacting to uh, what is already shot, put together. But this is uh, something unique. Leave it in the world. <laughs>
topic that we want to get to before we uh, open it up for a little uh, question and answer is uh, uh, going to be about uh, appropriation. Mm. And, uh, you know, I can remember, uh, you know, people talking about uh, only only black people can play the blues, you know, and, uh, and at first, you know, it seems like, well, that's great because, you know, I'm black and so I can play the blues. <laughs> But there's that flip side of the coin, and that you know that says that, that there are going to be some things that maybe I shouldn't play, and I didn't think that that was right. Uh, but when is it? When is when does it go from being uh, appropriating somebody's culture, uh, or when does it go from being sort of celebrating to to appropriating? I think when you're making mockery, when you're not of it. It doesn't matter, um, you know, listen, Miles Davis was asked that when he was at Juilliard. Uh, he was told that in order to play the blues, you gotta deal with, you gotta come from poverty and, and deal with pain. And he said, I didn't come from poverty. I'm, my family is okay and I'm fine and I can play the blues. There's a big misnomer about that, you know? I think playing the blues has a lot to do with having empathy for the human condition. You know, when you can feel somebody else's pain, or you can even feel your own pain, and you can convey that to an audience, that's playing the blues. You know, I've seen all different people from all different walks of life have their own version of the blues. I've seen other people who come in and try to assimilate the blues, and that's when it becomes appropriation. And we all can feel this insincerity in things. You know, that's what it is for me. You know, I, I, I don't like the notion of saying that you have to be a certain thing in order to, to play this. Because the blues is about telling your story. You know what I mean? And then also, one of the things that's like really, you know, uh, um, something we should talk about is like, it goes back to what we were talking about earlier. Okay, then what is the blues actually? You know? We use the blues now as a 12 bar form, but the initial, initial forms of the blues, which a lot of people don't talk about, there were different blueses. There were eight bar blueses, six bar blueses, 12 bar blueses. There was all these different forms of the blues, but now it's whittled down to this one thing that we've called the blues, right? I think we have to be careful with that. Now, I definitely understand that there's appropriation going on. I, I, we see it every day. There's no doubt that that's happening. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and it's happened from, for generations, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, it's one of the reasons why I've always loved the Rolling Stones and those guys and the Beatles, right? The Beatles came over here and told you, said, listen, man, I, I listened to Mother Waters. Mm -hmm. They gave it up, yep. right? And, it, and so, so is that appropriation? No, they're showing appreciation, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? It's when people try to hijack something as it being their own, and it's insincere. You know what I mean? That's what it is for me. So yeah, when we talk about insincerity, what this actually means is uh, taking on uh, a specific art form, since we're talking about music, taking on an art form, and using it to your convenience, and it's coordinate when it's not a convenience for you anymore. So uh, like usually, what I've seen throughout history is that white folks tend to grab on to black music when it's convenient for them, when they want to appear to be more spicier, or edgier, or raunchier, or hardcore, and appeal to the black crowd, they'll go grab some black music and sing that for an album. But then, as soon as they want to deviate away from that particular image that comes with that, then they go venture off and turn into super soft pop somewhere, you know? <laughs> so part of that, that's, that is one of the main cores of, of appropriation. You know, you want people taking the culture and using it to their convenience, and, and, and at their convenience, and not really, it's not paying it homage. It's literally for, um, uh, just for profit. So it's m other levels of doing it, not just the artist. The industry itself is doing it, like heavily right now. It's, it's doing it to the point where hip hop, the music that you hear on the radio is not hip hop. Most of it. Some of it is. Some of it is full-blown hip-hop, but for the most part, it is people selling products, people being, uh, they're, more, they're more so selling clothing products, cars and stuff for people, more than they are actually selling music. 
Um, we're also dealing with the age of the digital age where music is uh, anybody can be a musician these days. Like, but it is not because of a talent that you have. It's because of how many followers you have mm -hmm. on Twitter and on Instagram. Right now, I can't get a manager because I don't have enough followers on Twitter and Instagram. I have the music, I have the archive, and it's not just me. It's plenty of people out there with the same story who are great musicians, but still can't get to the next level because we had to transfer from the hard copy to the digital age, and we did, we did not know that it was going to be that important to have such a large following at the, at the turn of the century and then on to the 2010s. So that led to people being able to grab specific artists and say, hey, they're selling records. That's the reason why, I mean, your music isn't hot because it, it's not selling records. No, our music is hot, it's not playing, it. it's different. You know, <laughs> if you play it, then it'll be hot. You know, so far I haven't had any bad experiences, but the thing is, is that when they grab onto these records, it's not because of the actual, they don't care about how good you are as a rapper or a singer or any of that. They care about if you have the numbers to drive them in, which is a lazy marketing scheme for me. As far as I feel, I, as far as I look at it, it's lazy marketing. You don't feel like you can go grab a great artist and turn them into a big star because you didn't do your marketing job on your, on your end as opposed to grabbing an artist who's already got millions of followers, who's trash. You know, so they don't really care about that. You know, so I think that's the biggest part of it. I think a lot of times um, presenters Managers don't know what quality is, oh. right? So they they, that's job. why <laughs> that's why they need to know that you have X number of followers. Right. Otherwise, if they could, if they knew, I went to a concert at um, uh, Lincoln Center one time, and um, this woman who had subscri subscription tickets and was, you know, one of these. Um, kind of aloof <laughs> New Yorkers at the time. And I, I, I'm, I'm not the kind of person to just say New Yorkers are mean, uh, like that, that's silly. But she was kind of like one of these snobby New York types. And she, she, she leaned over to me and she said, is this person good? Wow. And I'm like, you gotta ask me. And you're sitting here like making me feel bad about like that I'm not from here. <laughs> Well, I'm going to tell you, there's another form of appropriation that we never talk about enough. And being a jazz musician is one that always hurts my heart. When pop artists' careers start to wane, they all make jazz records. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and it's like, okay, yeah, why are you coming over here now? Yeah. <laughs> you know, because when you were selling product, we couldn't get you on the phone. Right. You know, but all of a sudden, you want me to make a record with you? So now you want me to justify your existence? in the jazz world. You know, I've had a couple of offers for big money to do that, and I turned it down. I said, no, that's, I'm, I'm not about that. You know, if, if, and it would be different if, if the person um, was different. Okay, like, I'm not name dropping, but I, I just had an experience with a very famous pop star who is doing a show in Vegas, and she actually does a jazz show. And when I talked to her, she was telling me how much she loved Dinah Washington, right? And that's a part of her show. So when she's singing it, I don't feel like she's appropriating. You know what I mean? Because this has always been a part of her, and she's not ashamed to show that, right? It's when, man, I've, it's, it's been happening since I've been with our Blakey, you know? And our Blakey was the one that pulled my coat to her. And he said, don't worry, we'll see them later on in their career. Wow. When, when they're not playing the stadiums anymore, and they have to play concert halls and clubs, they all become jazz musicians. Well, you, you know, with some with some of these some of these folks that think that wow. you know, what do you give back to? And you know, remember the Rolling Stones used to used to have folks like Muddy Waters open for them. I do have to say though that when when Chuck Berry here in St. Louis when he passed away, you know, the Stones sent a nice you know nice flower arrangement, but. <laughs> Keith really owes his whole sound to Chuck Berry. You know, I understand that they're, but I mean, because this is really his musical, musical father, and you know, nobody, none of the, none of the guys from the British Invasion made it to the, made it to the service. Well, and, and it's, it, it is an issue, man. But also, it's one of those things where they have to be courageous enough to step out there mm -hmm. and make the statement. 
you know, I was telling these folk backstage, there was a famous rapper that I was uh, on the same <laughs> roster with, and management roster, booking roster, I'm sorry, uh, with for a while, and we were at an event, and the photographers came over, and he got, he got up and he said, this would be bad for my image to be seen with a jazz musician. You know what I mean? And I went, dude, you totally got that one flipped. <laughs> but I didn't want to end up starting ruckus with him. But, but, but the, point, the point being is that, you know, uh, um, we appropriate these things like she said when it's convenient, when it's necessary. It's different for me if somebody comes up and says, man, like, you know, when Branford always would play uh, with the Grateful Dead. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That's different. You know, people are showing appreciation for different art forms, you know? Um, it's, it's something that we have to realize and call out, I think. I think we have to call it out because I look at it as a total, the highest form of disrespect. Because what you're saying is that, oh, I can do that. And it's only packaged right. It's only packaged right if it's in that format. Like it, it's not palatable if it's a black face saying it. When it's a white face that did the exact same thing that I just went and did. Now all of a sudden they're selling out tickets and they're selling out stadiums, which is something that I see is a, a huge problem that I see as far as the audience goes. Um, when we get white rappers, okay, hip hop has been here and it's been very mixed genre and people of color for. 50 years now. It had its 50 year anniversary a couple years ago. So when we go to these concerts, you will be surprised to see how different it is. These certain people are not just here to see a good hip hop show. A lot of people are here to see a good white rapper show. So Post Malone is here. We got Logic. We got Eminem. And, uh, and we got, uh, what's the girl name? I Iggy, you got uh, us a bunch of them that, that, that have found a place in hip hop, right? But when you look at the crowd, it's all white folks. So, but when I look at my crowd, it's all black folks. I got a lot, I got a pretty nice white following, Steve. <laughs> Steve, the, I can actually use him, sorry. I can actually, actually use him, him and Grant, he and Graham are really the only two people I can say consistently will come to one of my shows. Because most people are afraid that they're in the hood or it's in the ghetto and are we gonna get robbed? And oh my God, just come to the damn show. It's right the street from Attitude. It's the same club you go to every weekend. It's no different, you know? But but the thing is, it's a stigma around black music and they're afraid, they're afraid, it's the fear. They're, they're so afraid of us that we are missing the buck here. The biggest problem with hip hop in general, especially St. Louis hip hop, is that we cannot generate enough white dollars. We get the, we can grab enough black people, but for real, if the majority of people in the city are black, I mean are white, then you need to grab, you, they need to come to the concert too, and not just when it's another white rapper on stage. So I'm going to see, uh, see uh, diversity when it comes to consumers. They gravitate to the white face as opposed to going to the same. Twister been rapping fast forever, way before Logic was. You know, and, and I don't see that crossing crossing over like it should. Well, well I want to make sure that we give, because uh, we're, we're getting uh, towards the end, so I want to make sure that we give uh, the audience a chance to ask some questions. So if anyone has a question out there for any of the panelists or for all the panelists, we would be happy to, to take some at this time. So does anybody have any, anything they'd like to ask? Yes. Okay, so just to it's, make sure that everybody hears the, the question was about uh, how does streaming uh, how does streaming affect uh, uh, your your income and your income streams? It's 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 taking a huge hit. You know, and the sad part about it is the government's not doing the thing about it. I've been part of Grammys on the Hill where we actually go up to DC and talk to these folks. And frankly, man, I, we would, I'll never forget it. We were in Jason Chaffin's office, and 
Uh, I was there with a bunch of people, songwriters, and it's really worse for the songwriters. I'm a performer, so I, I get performance fees and I travel, but it's for the songwriters where that's where they make all of their money on the residuals from those songs being, being uh, played. And this guy, he, he really, I told him, I, he, well, I, what he told me was, you got screwed by the record companies because the record companies made a bad deal with all these streaming services, which is true. Record companies have traditionally been behind the eight ball when it comes to technology. When the CDs first came out, they didn't know what to do with CDs, right? They were behind that. When the digital thing came out, they were behind that. You know, and now with the streaming thing, they thought they didn't know what was going to happen. So they made this deal for a little bit of money and gave away all the rights to all of this stuff. But my point to him was, that's why you're an elected official. Mm -hmm. You know, if we have no other recourse, you're the guy that we're supposed to come to to help help find us find some remedies. And they're not willing to do the work. And the reason why I think is because the streaming companies are writing checks to them. It has to be. You know what I mean? For him to be so stern about the solution. But we know what the solution is. The solution is for those guys to pay the right royalties. You know, it's amazing. I didn't even know all of my music was on Spotify because I sure as hell didn't put it up there. You know what I mean? But people were constantly telling me, oh man, I heard your thing. I'm like, where'd you, where'd, I'm just curious, where'd you, where'd you, oh, it was on Spotify. So people are not buying product. And as a result, the record companies are taking a hit. Blue Note Records, the label that I'm signed to, man, is dwindling down to a few people just being at the label. Period. You know? And uh, uh, Maria Schneider and some other people have put together a group to try to fight this. But we can't do it alone. You know what I mean? And, 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 and the, the sad part about it is that so many young musicians don't understand how serious it is because they've never received royalties for anything, period. You know what I mean? So they don't know what they're missing out on, you know? I'm old enough to remember, man, when it got a little thin, that royalty check came royalty in right on time. I was like, <laughs> thank you, Jesus. You know what I'm saying? It happened right on time. And now, man, it's, it's, it's rough. You know, for me being a film composer, it hasn't hit the film industry quite like that yet. It, it's still hitting it, but not quite as yet. So my royalty checks from the film industry are very different. But from the recording industry, it's awful. And the thing that's really awful about it, even the guys that are on our side on the hill, give us the runaround. I'm not gonna name any names, man, but there's some senators we wanted to talk to we're gonna fight for you, we really believe in you, we're gonna give it the good fight. And I went, man, I don't wanna do that. I really don't wanna hear that. Because I know you're just buying time till we leave your office, yeah. you know? This is really about our livelihood. Some of these guys, there was one guy, it was amazing, man, when we did it, because I'm talking about people who have written hits that all they ever listen to. I mean, huge hits. One guy was talking about the thing got seven, uh, six million spins on one of those streamers, maybe Spotify, right? right. Yeah. And he got a six hundred dollar check. Wow. For Red got uh, for Happy, he had right. six million spins That's on that, right. and he got two thousand yeah. dollars in royalties back. And I had said, and when I saw that, I said, man, I just made more money than Pharrell selling my CD yeah. hand in hand than right. what he made exactly. spending six million times. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And the other, and the crazy part about it with Spotify, people are creating playlists on Spotify with your music on it. It's being used in a way that you didn't even intend it to be used, right? So the government has to step in and do something. You know, because we, I, the thing, the argument that we were using with those guys is that Spotify is kind of like what FedEx was. FedEx, to get in the industry, they man, they said, oh, we're gonna have this, you know, this service and we're not gonna charge you much money. Well, now the rates have kind of gradually got to the point where they're making huge profits. Well, Spotify, and to that Spotify's argument, oh, we don't have that many subscribers. That's bullshit, I'm sorry, but that's bullshit. You know what I mean? That, this thing has been growing month by month, right? And it's, an, it's and I'm getting ready to go back on the hill because uh, now the Grammys on the hill just called me again. So we go, we're gonna go back up there and, 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 and continue this fight because it's an important one because not only for me, but like I said, for the songwriters, for people who just sit at home and create, the songs that people love to listen to and experience. That's the only way they make money. And for the government, for these guys to sit back and say, oh, no, 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 go talk to the record companies, it's ludicrous. 
You know, that's why I was saying earlier, uh, one of these things we did uh, a couple of days ago, it's about us voting. That's really what it stems and what it boils down to. It's about us making our choices in the ballot box, saying we need to put people in office who are going to really look after our interests. And we need to put this on the docket. We need to put this out there. This needs to be part of the campaign, you know, when these people are running for office. But we are a small entity, the artists, not the record companies, the artists. We're a small entity. So that's why we need the help of the public to say, hey, man, what about, what about this issue? Because it's the li it, 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 these people are dependent on this stuff for their livelihood. Yes? Uh, I've got a, a question about performance. It almost sounds as though it's not OK for an opera singer to sing hip hop. Uh, and that I don't know how many uh, hip hop singers can sing opera or want to. But I like it that Terrence gives us blended stuff. Music is music. And it sounded as though it's not okay to cross over. Yeah. I will, I will, I'm going to just make sure I was clear on what I meant by when we have, because I, what I said was that we had a lot of white, white artists who are hop, they hop, who hop into hip hop and don't give back to the culture, don't, don't believe in the culture, same thing he was saying. And that is the real issue. It's not that we don't want white people or that we can't cross hip hop and opera. Because like if you listen to a lot of my music, I have a lot of opera in my music, a lot of opera samples. Courtney Nicole's in the, in the, in the uh, crowd right now, she's saying some opera on one of my songs. So it's not that we don't welcome opera singers. But I don't see any opera singers offering anybody welcoming, anybody welcoming hip hop. So that might be an issue since you, since you bring it up. I don't know, the thing I was gonna say was, I was part of a blog when, uh, when, when we brought Champion to New Orleans, it, a vlog, I should say, a video blog. Uh, and it was really interesting because there was, I can't remember the artist's name, but there was an artist who wrote an opera based in the hip hop world. And when I say that, I don't want you to think that somebody had just created beats and then had a hip hop artist sing on top of it. No, it wasn't that. It was composed music using the rhythmic, pulse of hip hop with through composed stuff for vocals. And when I heard it, I thought it was probably one of the most creative things I've heard. Of. But it goes back to the thing we were talking about earlier. Nobody knows about it. Nobody knows about it because this thing is existing in a small little vacuum and people who are marketing that product that can't see any value in it. Right? And for me, when I heard it, I was saying, wow, that could be like the new thing for a lot of young kids to enter this world. Because, you know, it's, 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 it's hard. I've watched Beyonce, man, on her show, the Essence Festival in New Orleans. You know, because we, we, we have to constantly t tackle this. I watched her sing an aria in the middle of her show. A lot of people don't know that she's, she's, she's really accomplished, man. I watched her sing an aria in the middle of her show and then the crowd not really respond. They kept waiting for something else. Well, what I realized is, is that she's doing it during the show and not putting it on the records. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So that needs to change for her. She needs to make it a part of the projects, right? So the kids can get accustomed to it and say, man, what is that? But to throw something new at them, and I thought it was brave of her to do it because she did it in a very immaculate way. I was, I was the only person out there that super dope like, woo! <laughs> you know, because it was amazing when she, the way she did it, you know. But, but there are instances of that happening. But what we were talking about was the appropriation of these art forms, you know, and how people come in and just try to use it like, like she was saying, for their own convenience. See, I think wh whoever that artist, what they were doing was, was doing what I tried to do, is see the value in all of these different things and using them for their strengths and bringing them together to create something that's really unique and new and valuable, right? Not as, not trying to say, let me do this so I can just grab the kids. Mm -hmm. No, it wasn't that, it didn't have that vibe to it at all. It, it felt very earnest and honest. I think you touch on also an important part and that is 
that artist that you described, he can't market his stuff. I mean, it costs a lot of money yeah. to market. Yeah. You know, unless you have somebody who's backing you up. I mean, we know, it's like staring us in the face in the news right now, how uneven the playing field is with money, you know? So that's, that's a big piece in, in a lot of this too. I'm, I'm just gonna give, throw out some numbers for you for some jazz artists to have a digital marketing person, right? And we're talking about jazz artists, right? They have a digital marketing person to just go out there and post. Now, this is the thing that's most amazing to me. It's just to post on Twitter, Instagram, and all of the other services. It can cost you three to four thousand dollars a month. Five thousand. Five thousand. I'm going to change jobs. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's how yeah. Yeah. But yeah, and they throw those numbers out like you know, it's like okay, yeah, well that's what it costs. I'm like really? You know, I mean, all of, listen. There, there are a few of us in the jazz world that are that are successful and doing okay, but that's not the majority of the jazz world. It's just not. And those type of numbers, when you have, you know, a band, you have management, you have booking, you have other uh, support staff that you have to pay to, to keep the thing moving, four grand a month is a, is, a, is, a, is a big chunk of that that you have to pull out just for somebody to go on Instagram. I have a philosophical problem with that. <laughs> I think we've got time for one more. Yes. Has the uh, has Hamilton influenced the music industry, especially among young people? Well, this is what I'll say. Um, I think Hamilton was great. I haven't personally haven't seen it. Can't get a ticket. Uh, but I don't think so. I, I don't. I don't. Not from what I've experienced in the musicians that I encounter. You know. Um, again. I think it has a lot to do with the fact that it's Hamilton, and it's not a story that's relevant to their lives. Most of those kids aren't historians. You know, they're not going to sit down and go, "Oh, I want to learn about our political history in this country." No, especially with what's going on right now, they can give a damn about political history in this country. You know, um, but I do think there there are uh, a lot of things like the opera I was telling you about that are happening that are not getting any light. But a lot of these young kids, I'm starting to see, man, they're creating their own world. They're doing it on their own. And I think that's what the digital revolution is, is, has the power to do. It really hasn't really flushed itself out like that yet because of so many different avenues. But it has the power to say, no, we don't care about you. We're gonna do our own thing, you know? And I think in the coming future, it's gonna be interesting to see how it all works out. I think when we start to find these avenues where people can make these connections rather quickly, right? You'll see a change. I say, in order to meet, in order for you to get these kids right now, even white kids, or, or the, the white kids are the largest consumers of hip hop music right now. So if that, that should tell you something. In order to get, if your kid is resonating with hip hop music and you, you want them to be, you want your kids to go and run into Hamilton, you have to, you have to create some sort of segue for them to do that. They're not going to go look for that themselves. Um, you, like I was telling, telling you guys earlier about hip hop and classical meeting together and hip hop being the culture of people and how you can get them into classical. This is, that was what I was saying, sweet lady. Uh, that you can get people, it's hard to get people from hip hop to classical unless you meet them where they're at. You have to meet them where they're at. Because you're talking about kids here, they're not trying to learn nothing new, they're defiant, they don't care. Like, so uh, you have to present them with something that's engaging towards them. So writing for those kids, inviting those kids, bringing children, bringing those kids in onto the stage with you will get those kids that are not necessarily some older person's movement that older people attach to. Well, the other thing, too, that we need to talk about when it comes to Hamilton, the other part of it, too, is an economic issue. You know, that's, that's, a, lot. that's, 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 that's a huge ticket yeah. for young kids to go out and purchase it's and buy. It's a huge ticket for yeah. adults. It's a huge ticket. You know, for the, and the thing about it is, to what she was saying is, 
kids will save up to go to a concert that means something to them. You know what I mean? So I don't, I don't want to, you know, because there are kids that will save up $50 or, or $70 or whatever to buy a ticket to a show of, of something that they're really into. But for something that doesn't really resonate in their life, you know, to spend that type of money, I don't see them doing it. Now, I do see kids going, but that's because the parents are saying, this is something of value that you need to experience. Which is also, I have no problem with that, because that's how I went to the orchestra, that's how I went to the symphony, you know, and saw great performances. That, that's what my parents were all about, exposing me to a broader world. So I, I, I get that, but at the same time, is Hamilton changing it for the young kids? I don't, I don't see that, I don't see that happening because it's not something, the story itself is not something that resonates with them. All right, well ladies and gentlemen, we want to thank you all very much. This is going to uh, conclude the, uh, the formal part of the program today, but we do uh, encourage you all to stick around because we have some, uh, some, some, some refreshments over here, and we hope that you'll stick around and enjoy some further conversation with our panelists. And how about we give them all a nice round of applause. tell you how much fun uh, Champion was and uh, this is already shaping up to be another great experience. Uh, so thank you all very much for coming out and we hope that uh, we will see you again here at the Bistro and then again at Opera Theater. Okay.